Are you or someone you know a caregiver? Are you feeling exhausted, stressed, frustrated, and ill at ease with your new role? Are resources available to help caregivers be more successful while feeling less anger, isolation, and sadness? Hello, my name is Attorney Ramsey Barawi, and welcome to Your Money, Your Life. In this segment, my guest is Gary Bark, founder and editor-in-chief of the first national magazine for caregivers called Today's Caregiver. Gary also founded the original online caregiver community called caregiver.com. In addition, Gary created the Fearless Caregiver Conferences, which brings together caregivers to share their knowledge, experience, and wisdom while learning about vital products, services, and technologies. Then there's Gary's book, The Fearless Caregiver, which is a treasure trove of practical advice and inspirational stories. But that's not all. Gary's awards include the Mature Media Award for Writing, the International Television Association Golden Reel Award, and the Southern Gerontological Society Media Award. Gary also serves as a member of the Board of Trustees of the National Adult Day Services Association and a member of the Board of the American Association for Caregiver Education. Gary, welcome to Your Money, Your Life. It's great to have you on the program. Thanks for the invitation, Ramsey. I, re I really enjoy this program, so I'm honored to be part of it now. Well, we're honored to have you on the program. Gary, today we are flooded with all sorts of information about the graying of America. However, I don't recall that being the case in 1995, that being the year you founded the first national magazine for caregivers, Today's Caregiver, as well as the original online caregiver community, caregiver.com. Tell us a little bit about Today's Caregiver magazine as well as caregiver.com. Well, everything that we do from Today's Caregiver magazine, caregiver.com, Fearless Caregiver conferences started out of our own need as a family. Um, as you said, it was uh, 1995, but actually in 94, I came back to South Florida to help my mom care for my grandparents, which was after she cared for my dad, who retired and passed away from bone, bone marrow cancer about a year and a half later. And um, I thought that there'd be all this advice and support and information. And as mom was caring for my grandparents at this point, and there really wasn't. So as we walked in and out of the different long-term care facilities or went to different meetings and talked to various caregivers, we were all learning from each other. You know, the family caregivers were learning from each other. So we decided it just, you know, hit me one day that, you know, you know plumbers have magazines and bankers have magazines and people who do the most amazing job in the universe, the family caregivers, need some central focus of information, support and advice. And this was, the first edition ran off, came off the presses in uh, actually 4th of July, 1995. And the, we got um, caregiver.com in October of 95 and hosted our first Fearless Caregiver Conference in 98. And we haven't looked back since. Basically what you're saying is that you had a personal experience with regards to caregiving that prompted you or motivated you to then start your magazine and start your, your online presence? Honestly, any of the best advocates or even a lot of the care professionals I know, if you ask how they got started in supporting and advising um, the family caregivers, it was as their own role in the family caregiver, looking for what they needed. Or as a family caregiver, they were able to do so much and support their loved ones so much when their caregiving ended, they didn't want to stop. So they went into nonprofit world or, you know, started uh, uh, me in media or even went back to school and got medical degrees. So um, it's not such a unique situation because every time I talk to advocate or professional caregiver I respect, uh, I've drilled down, you know, far enough and their interest in caregiving started because they needed to support themselves. Now in business, a critical issue is differentiation. Can you tell our viewers what exactly differentiates your magazine from other po uh, resources that are available to caregivers? Well, I, I have always said here, it's like the 92 Olympics or uh, 92 election, you know, it's the economy stupid. For mm -hmm. us, it's the caregiver stupid. 
anything we do, anything we write, any conversation we have has to help the caregiver uh, in their process of caring for the loved one, caring for themselves, uh, making sure they don't you know, fall out of the circle of care as they're caring for their, their loved ones. And, and that's moved us along. So the magazine started, and, and just a quick an anecdote, first edition of the magazine uh, was local to South Florida. And I remember driving in and up and down the southeast coast, Florida coast, in and out of hospitals to deliver them to waiting rooms. And I sat down and I, I saw two elderly ladies sit down and picked up the magazine. And one opened it and pointed to an article about diabetic foot care and started educating her loved one to deal with her own diabetes and, and, and foot issues. She said, see, white socks. So I knew we had something. I think that, you know, the, there is no other publication, there's no other magazine, there's no other um, uh, 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 media that actually talks to caregivers as specifically, I think. You know, we don't talk over them. We don't, we're not even too medically specific. It's just, what does that caregiver need? I want every article to be able to give the caregiver one piece of advice, you know, one motivation, a story about how a caregiver solved a challenge that they can then take into their own life as a family caregiver. I saw an advertisement for your magazine that basically said that your magazine was for, about, and by caregivers. And I think that phrase, for me anyway, that, that distilled it all for me. That's really what it's all about. I appreciate that, and that's how we, we live. It's uh, the advice at our fearless caregiver conferences, our caregiver to caregiver. We don't have people walk from room to room. We don't PowerPoint or speechify them. It's all about the communication. We bring experts, uh, local, national. We bring celebrities. But mostly, we open a form, a form for the caregivers to educate each other, motivate each other walk into a room with 400 caregivers thinking you're the only person in the country going through this and you know you walk out uh, with as somebody said to me at a recent conference with 50 pounds of rocks off your shoulders what prompted you to start the fearless caregiver conferences you've told us a little bit about what the purpose of the conferences are but as you said earlier you know you you, you started your magazine and, you, and then your website, and then later the conferences. What was the motivation behind that? Well, at the very beginning, as I said, we were local to this community, and people were getting the magazine and were calling, and, and, and I would you know, run into them. And the idea was to create a, a, an event where caregivers can you know, meet each other and learn from each other and le learn uh, advice from the medical and the social professionals. So we held a traditional event. And 400 plus people came, and and Robert Urich was there, the uh, wonderful uh, actor who passed away about uh, 10 years ago, and it was a real um, love fest. I have no better way to put it. Between uh, you know, it was it was about sharing wisdom between the professionals and the families and the advocates, and so we were asked to do it in another community and then do it in another community. So that conversation we have on caregiver.com in our newsletters and our e-blasts and the same conversation we have in the magazine we want to wanted to bring to people you know in a live setting but then we very quickly realized that you know the stars and the celebrities at the i always say but you have 400 caregivers in a room and one celebrity like debbie reynolds who came to a few events with us who is also a caregiver all you really have is 401 caregivers the wisdom and the pieces of the puzzle that the caregivers learn from one another uh, it just are, are mind-blowing and staggering. So the concept of being a fearless caregiver, being standing up for your loved one and learning to care for yourself and, and not taking no for an answer, that's so much easier uh, presented by their fellow caregivers than by me standing on a stage with um, PowerPoints and speechifying at them. It, Gary, is the, the term fearless caregiver, does that come from what you just said where, where the caregiver has to stand up for the caree and speak for the caree and advocate for the caree? Is that where the term fearless comes from? Well, um, actually, it, it's the title of 
my first book, and it's, it's, it's in its fourth edition now. And I was sat and tried to figure out what was, what I was trying to communicate to family caregivers. What was the lesson? I didn't just want to say, you know, go get rest or here's how you do that, here's how you do this. Because I, I always think if you don't believe that you're in charge, if you don't believe that you're the CEO of Caring for Your Loved One, Inc., or the manager of all these services, you can't get things done. So the core was to say, okay, I believe that this family caregiver needs to be an integral member of their loved one's care team. And I need, believe actually they need to be the primary member. And the word fearless came to me and it just stuck. And, and that's what caregivers will say to, say to me when I say fearless, they say, that's it. That's the perfect word. That's the aspiration that I, liked, uh, I, I want to uh, learn to be, which is, is, is fearless in my application of care and in dealing with the healthcare system and, and getting my loved ones to help me as I care for them. And, but I, I always say, yeah, but you know what the first job is? The first job is caring for yourself. And that's a hard thing for family caregivers and, you know, to realize we need to start taking ourselves out of the circle of care and realize that if we don't care for ourselves, who's gonna step in and care for us and ours? In, in regard to what you just said in terms of taking care of yourself, is it important for the caregiver to, to reach out and, and get help, whether it's from other family members or from other resources? Absolutely. And, and it's really challenging. According to the National Family Caregivers Association, who's, turned, who's become CAN, it's a great organization. Years ago, they did a study that said one of the greatest challenges, probably the greatest challenge to supporting family caregivers is self-identification. You know, you talk to someone who doesn't even believe they're a caregiver, but they're spending 80 hours a week caring for their loved one, 40 hours a week at work, not sleeping, not eating right, and everything that they do is centered around the job they do at caring for their loved one. So I, I think that isolation is the killer for family caregivers. And I think that reaching out, going to events, finding out about the Area Agency on Aging, the ADRC, coming hopefully to caregiver.com, converse, having conversations with us uh, through our newsletter and, and even through our social media, connects that, the caregivers and makes them realize, hey, I'm not alone. And you know what? There are people who have solved some of these challenges I thought nobody can solve. How do I get dad to eat? How do I get mom to change doctors if I believe she needs to? How do I stay involved? You know, so all of those things become the job role of the family caregiver. And as you said, the, the key is to help a, a caregiver understand that uh, there is no, that the worst phrases, the worst words a family caregiver could feel about, uh, about what they're doing is shame and fear and embarrassment, isolation. Those are the killers. So they have to reach out. They have to contact the Alzheimer's Association. You know, go online, see these tapes, and realize 66.7 million people in the country caring for a loved one, they are not alone. Are you saying that the major challenges that caregivers face are isolation, shame, uh, as, as you put before, or are there other challenges as well? Oh, sure. I mean, caregiving is n not an easy thing. Um, when I first started caring for my dad, I ran into a book called The Road Less Traveled. And uh, I read the first three words and I said, okay, that's it, I got it, absolutely. The first three words in that book is life is difficult. Yes, life is difficult. Caregiving makes life even more difficult. But, I, but being isolated, not sharing you, you know, uh, with other caregivers, not being involved, um, is really, a, a, frankly, a death spiral to, to family caregivers. And I've done a lot of speaking. We've done a fearless caregiver, um, a rural conference tour. And I've been in and out of um, the most rural communities, as well as, you know, the biggest urban communities. And so, you know, the challenges in many cases are the same. The opportunities are different sometimes for to get that support. So. But there is support. You can, again, there's the area agency, there's the ADRCs, there's the organizations. Sometimes caregivers don't even need a official support group. They can just meet for coffee. 
It's just that idea of believing that, you know, reaching out uh, is where you're going to find the solutions that you need or the support you need as a family caregiver. Families oftentimes live a great distance apart. How do you recommend that family members approach uh, distance caregiving, you know, where members of the family are living a, a, a great distance apart? It's a challenge. And I'll tell you what the, ho the holidays sometimes, um, as opposed to being, you know, as stressed as they possibly can be for a family caregiver, I always say they're a great opportunity. You know, whether you were, if you're the CEO of Caring for Your Loved One Inc., and your family members come flying in and think they know what's going on, it's a good opportunity to sit them down and have what I like to call board of directors meetings, have topic specific meetings with them to talk to them instead of, you know, argue or, or try to get them to understand that things aren't what they seem like when they're in town for two days and have the information in front of them and treat your family members at board of, board of directors. What can they do? What support can they offer? Is it just financial? You know, if your sister-in-law is a nurse, maybe all, all you need is for her to look over the medical records. Or, you know, maybe your brother, all you need for him is pay for an incontinence. You're managing um, this group of people. And I think one of the, 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 the the greatest things to learn when it comes to being a CEO of Caring for Your Loved One, Inc., is when actually you may need to give up on somebody without having arguments and stress, just just move on. But you can create your um, board of directors if you take it as an opportunity when you're involved with your family members. And I'll tell you one other thing, there's there are a lot of great um, online resources now to share information, um, to, to share the latest news with the people you want to share it with. So every time mom goes to a doctor, you don't have to pick up the phone and call 50 people. What I understand you're saying is as, as we approach the holidays, it's important because families do get together over the holidays for family members to sit down and you called it a board of directors meeting. I, I call it having the talk. Uh, but, it, yeah. But it's, it's basically the same thing. So you have an agenda and you discuss particular issues, issues that I would discuss if I were meeting with, with, with my elderly parents would be, you know, what are your goals? Uh, what, what's your financial situation? What have you done in terms of your, your legal matters? And are you prepared for elder care when that day comes? Um, and I, I, I'm presuming that you would agree that those, those are the types of issues to discuss. And I think it's important that family members actually get all that out in the open because it's also my experience from my law, law office that oftentimes caregivers are thrust into that role. Absolutely. And, and they're not prepared. They're oftentimes very reluctant because they haven't been, pro they haven't been properly prepared. They haven't been educated to be a, a caretaker. Uh, and the whole thing comes totally by surprise. And then they feel, and I think this is where some of the shame and guilt comes in, then they feel that they actually have to be like Superman or Superwoman to do this job. And uh, it's, it really shouldn't be that way. So, you know, I agree with you, family, uh, holiday rather, is a, is a time when families get together and it's a great time for everybody to be able to put these issues on the table and see where things are going. How do you feel about um, caregiver agreements where, where there's an actual agreement between the caretaker and the, the care recipient? I think it's very important. I think that um, a lot of times there, there's such emotions, a caregiver doesn't want to getaway because they think no one can care for mom for a weekend or these conversations haven't happened or you haven't sat down officially with your family members and said you know what my time is worth something i want to do this out of love but i also think we need to have an official agreement and that's why you know i always think caregivers should find a way to get to a, a appropriate uh, elder care attorney like yourself to at least start the conversation or if they have a different kind of relationship where things they can have these conversations then look at it as again your ceo of caring for your loved one inc what do you need what do you need in services and support from your from your um, family members sometimes people come to the conference you know with their brothers or sisters and say and i've had this happen a few times you know i am the primary caregiver but two weeks a month, mom goes to my brother's house and I get away. So now you have the family working 
uh, on probably the most important business that they could ever have, which is making sure their, their loved one is um, cared for as well and as safely as possible without the caregiver falling apart and the caregiver dying. If, if I could say one thing, you, you mentioned something I think is extremely important, which is these board of directors meetings where you say, okay, mom, you know, uh, how are you set? Um, what are your thoughts? What are your wishes? Sometimes that seems a little aggressive to, in particular, a senior loved one, like, oh, now my kids are trying to take over. My advice is always there is to, to try to put your plan together, your five wishes. You have kids, you know, you have people that, are, that um, you're responsible for, and sit down at this meeting and say, okay, everybody, I'm not gonna give you my bank account number, I'm not gonna tell you anything, but if anything happens to me, here's the plan I have in place. It's a five wishes or it's advanced directives or now let's look at yours. So it takes the pressure off of pointing fingers. You know, Gary, I, I find that what you just said really interesting because I give the same advice. The advice that I basically give is if you want to find out what's going on with mom and dad, go to them and say, listen, we went and visited with our lawyer. Uh, we talked about doing all this planning. We now realize that this is really, really complicated stuff. What did you do? And open up the conversation. You're saying something very similar, which I find interesting because you and I have never discussed this before. I just interviewed Melissa Manchester, and I thought it was a master's class in caregiving, although she's not a professional uh, caregiver. And what she said was, you know, it, what I believe, and I know you believe, is that what you want to make sure that is always maintain the love and you always maintain the dignity. Those are the two things that I think if you're, especially if you're dealing with cognitive issues, the last two things people really understand, which is who loves them and who's treating them with dignity. And she said, it, you gotta find out where the dignity lies now. You know, dad may not be able to be the, you know, the, the attorney or the accountant he was, but he can feel that he's still doing something of, of value. So. I thought that was a great phrase, you know, you have to learn where the dignity lies and go there. You know, Gary, I've, I've seen it written that being a family caregiver oftentimes represents a transition within the family. Could you talk about how a caregiver can successfully navigate that transition in order to become a respected member of the loved one's care team? It's very challenging, you know, the, you, you get that metaphorical phone call in the middle of the night you know, the test came in, your loved one had an accident, your dad was wandering all of a sudden, and you you walk through the looking glass and everybody knows everything. You know, they know acronyms and they know the, the medicals and the, the situations and they know medications, and they're looking to you for advice and, and support. What do I do, what do I do? The first thing I think you need to do is take a deep breath, realize that it's the most loving job you'll ever have, but in a sense, it is the job. And what you need to do is go and reach out to people who are going through this, who are part of this. And it's amazing how much people who are challenged, you know, by uh, heavy duty caregiving will have time to support uh, their fellow caregivers. So the hardest thing, you know, it's another metaphor, but it's the frog in the water. You have to make sure that as soon as you find out you're dealing in a caregiving situation, that you ask questions of everybody. Don't feel embarrassed by the questions you ask. Keep asking questions until you feel like you've gotten the right answer. Find out who your support system is in your town. Reach out to your fellow caregivers and learn everything you can about, you know, caring for, for your loved one because you're right, it is a transition, but it, it can swamp us, it can overwhelm us. And frankly, unfortunately, some of the most important decisions we have to make as caregivers happen before we even get our bearing and our feet under, back under us. Gary, what's a good way to contact you? Well, we're caregiver.com, and anybody can email me at gary at caregiver.com, or 800-829-2734. And as I said, this holiday, we're doing a series of board of directors meetings talking how to talk with your loved one about incontinence, about long-term care, about um, home care. There's another whole conversation about when it's time to uh, that you may need home care, how you get your 
your family member you're caring for to accept it and, and benefit from it. Gary, that's a good place for us to stop. The reality of America's health care system throws many of the vital decisions, costs and burdens of elder care back on the family. It's no wonder that there are millions of family caregivers in the United States. But that's only half the story. Here is the really scary part. Being a family caregiver can be a breeding ground for resentment, anger, guilt, and broken relationships. The simple truth is caregivers are woefully unprepared for their role. Consider that being a caregiver involves much more than helping a loved one with shopping or rides to the doctor. Believe it or not, a caregiver becomes a manager of services. Therefore, it is vital to plan for this life process before it becomes a crucial necessity. What does all this mean to you? It comes down to this. Educate yourself. Seek out available resources such as Caregiver Magazine, which is designed to provide information, advice, and stories to help support family caregivers. Read Gary Barg's book, The Fearless Caregiver, which not only contains practical advice and inspirational stories, but also clearly defines the caregiver's role. And better yet, it teaches you to successfully deal with managed care organizations, home health services, and most importantly, your loved one. And don't forget to visit the caregiver.com website where you'll obtain the knowledge and skills necessary to be an effective caregiver. In closing, I'd like to thank my guest, the founder and editor-in-chief of the national magazine, Today's Caregiver, as well as the online caregiver community, caregiver.com. Gary Barg, thank you for your participation on the program. Thank you, Ramsey. It was great. I appreciate it. And as always, thank you to you, our viewers, for watching Your Money, Your Life. My name is Attorney Ramsey Barawi, building your trust. Mm -hmm.